All right, everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight. This is a little bit larger of a group, so that's always fun um, compared to what it has been. Uh, so hopefully we have some good discussion tonight. Tonight we are looking at the final mark of a healthy church, missions. And then this is really the first week of like the last several weeks, focusing more so on missions, uh, the mission of local churches. So that's where we're at tonight. So the first of several weeks then going forward in that. Um, this isn't going to be the exact same it, as the Sunday morning teaching time on missions. So if you have been in the class or are planning on being in the class, it's not going to be the exact same, but a lot of the stuff might sound similar and there will be some overlap, but it won't be the exact same lessons, just so you're aware of that. All right, well, I'll open this up in prayer and then we will start. Lord, we love you and we uh, praise you, God, for the gift of salvation, Lord, that we have in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that it's in Christ alone, by faith alone, that we can come to you and be adopted into your family. Lord, we thank you for imputing your righteousness onto us, Lord, so that when you see us, um, you see Christ in us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Christ's righteousness. Lord, I pray that we can uh, walk in a worthy manner, Lord, before you in a way that is blameless and holy, God, as you have called us to, Lord, as your church. I pray that we will do that as we carry out the mission that you have called all of us to. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. So, this morning, not this morning, this evening, uh, Marks of a Healthy Church Part 5, Missions, is where we're at. So you can see the goal for this week uh, to consider how a concern for missions makes a local church healthy or is one of the healthy marks of a local church. Um, review of past weeks. I brought this back in, uh, theological reflection, because I want to do some theological reflection kind of near the end of this lesson based on what we're talking about, missions, and bring it back around to this theological reflection idea that we're going to present right here, or at least remind ourselves about. Um, so what is theological reflection? And then we're going to remind ourselves the fill in the blanks for that next paragraph. So how have we defined theological reflection in the past? If you remember, it's been a month or so. That's right. I mean, we, we are to begin with God, remain with God, and end with God in our theological reflection. But if we were to define it, that's not necessarily what goes in that particular line. But Nancy is right. Um, consider the Lord through his revealed word? Yeah, so it's to contemplate or to consider God from his revealed word. Um, and that's really what theological reflection is, is to consider God from his revealed word. So should we be doing theological re reflection as we read scripture? Yeah, it's a devotional exercise. Um, just thinking about God based on what you're reading about him from his word. So now we're going to get to what Nancy mentioned. Uh, because theological reflection should always begin, remain, and end with God, and because he has revealed himself to us through his word to transform us, to be conformed to the image of his son, theology should not only be intellectual, but also transformational, um, which includes our what and what. How we say actions, but it's a different What was that? How we say attitudes actions. And no. Attitudes and behavior. Attitudes and behavior. You could say hearts, affections and behavior. So it's the idea of head, heart, hands, like the whole person. Right, so it does include our intellect, would be our head, then the, but it also includes our hearts and our behavior, what we do, our hands. Um, so however we want to word that. So it's the idea that we're transformed completely uh, as we consider God from his revealed word, uh, as we do theological reflection, uh, specifically for tonight, on missions and the mission of the local church, 
and how that should transform us, right? That's the goal, is to be conformed more into the image of Christ. And this is how we do theology as Christians, um, letting, it to, let it, letting it transform us. Um, our ecclesiology and missiology flow out of our doctrine of God and leads to doxology. Remember, um, ecclesiology is the doctrine of the church or the study of the church. Missiology is the study of missions. Both of those flow out of our doctrine of God because it begins with God, remains with God, and ends with God. So that just makes sense, right? Everything flows out of what we confess to be true about God and which leads to worship, which is doxology. And really, this is worship, worshiping God. So that's how we get to the end with God idea. Um, again, like I said, we're going to spend some more time on that at the very end of this lesson. Okay, some other quick reviews. In Matthew 16, we see Jesus give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the disciples, apostles, to Peter specifically. Yeah, anything like that could be in that first line. And in Matthew 18, we see the keys of the kingdom given to the church. The church. Wonderful. And then the last couple, just from last week, the church is to be congregationally what? Ruled. Ruled. Elder, led, led, and deacon, served. served. Yeah. So we have the basic structure of what local churches should look like there. Any comments or questions on review stuff? All right. Mark of a healthy church missions specifically tonight. So I like this topic a lot, and I'm excited for our discussion tonight on this. So before we jump into the, the texts itself, you can see I have some there. Um, let's start thinking about these questions. What is the mission of the church? And I say believers because I am asking that question more broadly here. I'm not just talking about a local church, but broadly, when we just say the church at large, believers, what is the mission of believers? And then how is it manifested? Hence, the how is it manifest is then getting kind of into the local church idea. So the core mission of the church is to glorify the Lord um, and do that through the Great Commission, spreading the word to the, the world and the nations and bringing in more believers. Okay. Glorify God, right? That's the purpose of our life is to glorify God. Um, anyone want to add? If glorifying God is the ultimate purpose, then this should also show us what our motivation ought to be in doing missions, is to glorify God, right? If our aim is to honor and glorify God, um, that should motivate us for all things in life. And if we are given a specific mission, such as the Great Commission, I mean, that should be motivating us to do that mission, right? To glorify God. Um, that's great. How is it manifested? So how do we, what does this look like? We could say what it is in the abstractly, but then how do you actually carry it out? Go to various people groups and tell them about Jesus. Go to various people groups and tell them about Jesus. So practically opening up your mouth and preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel. Also being an imager, showing what it's like Christ's -like life is like, being a good example in your okay. community and your, the people in your lives I think is probably one of the greatest ways you can either have a positive or a negative impact. That's right. I think we don't realize how much our behavior makes it an example. We're terrible behavior. That doesn't say very much for Christ. They find out we're Christian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. So we are to Tell people about Jesus and act like a Christian, right? Act like Christ. Um, what else? How is it manifested? Hmm? 
by the way we interact with others. Yes, by doing life with others, right? By personally evangelizing. Uh, that's what we've been talking about. Personally being um, an example for others. Um, but then also with what we've been talking about this whole semester of what it looks like to uh, be a, a local church, be then also a faithful member of a local church, right? One of the main ways that this is manifested, uh, the Great Commission, specifically if we're talking about missions, right, is through the local church. Um, this is why, and we've talked about this a lot already this semester, uh, local churches are the ones who send missionaries. They send missionaries to what? Plant new churches. So churches is what we see, local churches is the way we see missions carried out uh, in a practical way. And obviously that we have to evangelize, preach the gospel so people can come to saving faith. We have to have um, or be a good example for, for people to see the change that Christ brings right, in someone's life. So uh, what I have written down on my notes here, I, I wrote, it is manifested by believers acting like the church, um, acting the way that God has designed for us to act, the way he intends for us to act as believers, which is practically seen as acting like a local church so that disciples will be made um, of all nations, right? The churches are the ones who send out missionaries to plant more churches in different areas around the world. The church baptizes and the church disciples. We do that individualistically, yes. Uh, that's just what it means to be a faithful believer. But then to be a faithful believer, also that means to gather together as a local church and worship, glorify God, right, to that end. Uh, so the so that through the church, local church, the, man, the wisdom of God is seen. So let's look at a couple of these passages here. Um, so the first one, Matthew 28, is just simply the, the Great Commission passage um, that I think many of us know. Does anyone want to read Matthew 28, 16 through 20 here for us? All right. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right, so we see the command to go. Uh, this is the idea of expanding the kingdom of God. We've talked about the church as being an embassy of the kingdom of God here on earth. So when we go plant new churches, we're expanding the kingdom of God. Um, and where are they to go? To all nations. To really show God has dominion has over the entire world. Uh, so when you go somewhere to another place in the world, and God, Yahweh, is not known, and there's many other gods... Um, you don't have to be timid and, and think, oh, I don't necessarily belong here because that is an area also that God rules over and the people there just don't know it yet. Right? Um, so we're supposed to go to all nations because he rules over all. And what are we supposed to do? Baptize and teach. Those are the two commands there. Baptize, evangelize, really bring people into saving faith of Jesus Christ. And then teach is... The discipleship, discipleship component, right? So discipleship is part of the Great Commission for us to grow into the image of Christ more and more to become holy. Many times I think people just think of the Great Commission as purely evangelism, bringing people to the point of accepting Christ. But it's actually more than that. We need to disciple, train up people. Right? to be mature believers, teaching all that Christ has commanded. It's not just on the surface level, bringing someone to saving faith and then leaving them alone, right? but it's discipling them, training them, helping them grow in Christ. Um, Acts 1.8 uh, is also a very popular verse. Does anyone want to read this one for us? 
but you will see, receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. So again, this is a popular passage because it's really the outline of the entire book of Acts, uh, where you see the gospel starting in Jerusalem, then it expands, and it expands even more uh, with Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, and then there, also, it's the idea of going, expanding the kingdom, kingdom of God um, by establishing local churches all around the world. And so this starts in the New Testament, and it's continuing on, as we know, today. Right. Um, and then, th let's look at this Ephesians section here, <laughs> and I want us to think about back to the questions we, we were answering. What is the mission of the church believers and how is it manifested? Um, and I want us to think of that again as we read through this Ephesians passage. So does anyone want to read this for us? All right, Katie. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 310. So that, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I've been learning a lot uh, recently uh, just through the book of Ephesians, I s I've been spending a lot of time in the book of Ephesians uh, and about what it looks like to be a healthy church in Ephesians, and at least how Paul shares it, presents it in the book of Ephesians. Um, the first part of Ephesians, Paul is telling the church in Ephesus, this is who you are, this is your reality. And then in the later chapters, he says, now walk in a worthy manner of who you are. So here in these chapters two and three, uh, he's still just telling them who they are. Uh, you are the church. You are believers in Christ. And then later in the book, he'll say, all right, because of that, act it out in the way you act as a local church. Uh, but here in the beginning of verse 18 in chapter 2, we see Paul starting here just telling them who they are and how they even have access to God. Notice the Trinitarian structure here in verse 18. He says, through him, referring to Christ, we both have access in one spirit, who, where? To the Father. So it's always by the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father we have access so that we may worship, right? Because we begin with God, remain with God, and end with God by worshiping him. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens. So we are fellow citizens. We are brought into this family of God through him, right? We are already identified that as Christ with the saints and members of the household of God. So now here, this is interesting because it starts to talk about how the church is established, how it's built. It, it gives us the, the structure of the church here in this section. You see, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows. This is referring to the, the global church here, the universal church here, the group of believers, all believers here. Remember, it's in this beginning part where he's just telling them their reality. You're a part of the church because you're a believer. And then later it will get into then manifest that. Walk out in a worthy manner by being a part of a, a church locally. But it's important for us to see that it's established on the apostles, the, the prophets, and obviously Christ as the cornerstone. Um, and we see that in the book of Matthew. If you look at like the review section, uh, it starts with the apostles, right? The, the keys of the kingdom are given to the apostles and then it's handed over to the church at large. Um, the apostles are the ones going out, sharing the gospel initially, right? Paul, uh, 
his missionary journeys. You have the other apostles acting as the first pastors, starting the church. So they're acting as the, the foundation here. And they give us the New Testament, right? And then you could think of the, the prophets as well um, with the Old Testament. If you're talking about Old Testament prophets. Um, but yeah, the whole structure of the church is built on this being joined together in Christ and we're growing into a holy temple of the Lord. So this is who we are. This is our reality. So let's walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Um, what's significant about that, actually, in chapter 3, I'll get to you in a sec. Um, what's significant about that in chapter 3, we see actually then it's through this church, this structure, that God uses to reveal his own wisdom. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So not just to the rest of the physical world, but even to the spiritual world, God's wisdom is made known through the church. And how significant is that? And that's practically seen in and through local churches. Yes? Um, kind of a side point. Um, what it says here with fellow citizens with the saints, I, I love the habit of referring to fellow Christians as saints. Mm. Not at all in the Catholic way, but as a synonym for Christian, basically. You, know, yeah. you can say, oh, do you know so-and-so? Oh, yeah, they're just a sweet saint. And kind of, I, I, I like the title of, of being able to refer to each other that way. And I kind of think it just adds to um, sort of that like you know, familiar sense that you're saying with in the local church. That's right. Yeah. And Again, that goes back to what we talked about last time of why we're congregationally ruled, where we believe it's the congregation um, that make up the church because they are the saints. Right? It's not just the leaders. It's not just a select few, but it's all of us. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. And we see that carried out by that description. I had a professor when I was in college um, who would always refer to his students as saints. Because I went to a Bible school, so that's why he would do that. Um, um, I had a different professor that would say, refer to us as scholars, and I don't think that was warranted by any means. <laughs> but one of the others would always say saints. Um, so what is the mission of the church? Right, It's to display, to show the wisdom of God. Um, so that the wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And I mean, that's seen as the Great Commission is just being carried out. right? Us acting as faithful members of a local church, serving the church, being, just acting in our, in, um, like with what our reality is, right? Uh, and fulfilling the mission God has called us to. So, what should churches do in missions, then, is the next question. Uh, we identified that it is the mission of the church to carry out the Great Commission. Um, so, what does that look like? If, if someone were to ask you, like, what is the mission of, of the church? I hope you would say, really, it could just be summarized in Matthew 28. It's the Great Commission um, for us to carry out the Great Commission. And that's the way we glorify God. Um, we, we glorify God by living holy lives, right? But that's all part of um, growing in maturity, discipling others so they may also grow in maturity, being examples for all believers. So what should churches do then in missions? What are some initial thoughts here? What should we do? I've already said a couple things. We have six listed. Yeah, well, I said initially, what are your initial thoughts about looking ahead? <laughs> it's kind of hard to think about it without the framework of knowing, okay, you know, you partner with the mission organization, you have, you know, kind of a team, you can't just 
you know, plant churches and then run away, you know, but there, there are different types of missions trips. You can do evangelistic ones. You can do, you know, practical service. You can even serve missions by serving those who do missions. So I think there's multiple layers to it. Yeah, yeah. The common goal, ultimately, though, should be to serve the church, right? Whether it's, I mean, generally it's the church um, in the location that you're going to, right? More so than your own church. But, you, I mean, you're serving your own church as well, in a, in a way, by doing that. Um, so what should churches do in missions? It's serve the church, serve other churches. So really, um, the local church is really the, the means and the end of missions, it's the means and the end of missions. It's the means because we do missions through local churches. And it's the end because our goal is to plant more churches. And it's, when it's through the local church like that, then, I mean, the kingdom of God is just expanding. And we can't say that because what is local church? It's, it's a physical representation here on earth of the body of Christ. Right? So it's making it about Christ. When we say it's the means and the end, we're not taking away the emphasis on God himself, but we're actually rather putting it on him because he is the body, or the church is the body of Christ. Um, any comments or questions on anything so far? All right, so as Lion pointed out, there are several things here listed answering this question. What should churches do in missions. Some of these I actually got from the book Nine Marks of a Healthy Church in the chapter on missions. Some of them I did not. Um, but I think this is a general good list. It's definitely not exhaustive by any means. Um, but what should churches do in missions? I mean, learn about God's heart from the nations. Uh, that's really where it starts, right? We care about missions. We care about going to the nations in order to glorify God. How is that glorifying God? Because we're creating more worshipers of God. Um, and we do it because we have a heart for it, because God first had a heart for it. So learn about God's heart for the nations. We see this really begin all the way back in Genesis. If you're going to do like a biblical theology of missions, it starts all the way back. Um, where it was through the nation of Israel, God intended them to be a blessing for all nations. In Genesis chapter 12, in the beginning of Genesis chapter 12, um, he has nations in focus through the nation of Israel. Um, you see that in the first three verses in Genesis chapter 12. And then you see that narrative play all the way out through then the seed of Abraham, which is ultimately Christ, where that blessing is expressed um, to all nations then, for all those who are able to, or for all those who come in union with Christ. All right, so I, I put here, as you can see, Psalm 67. This is a famous missions-focused psalm uh, where we do see God's heart for the nations. Um, does anyone want to read this for us? It looks kind of weird because I condensed it. You know, it's, Psalms is like, it's poetry and um, has verses, but I condensed it so it just looks like a block paragraph, so it doesn't look nice. But does anyone want to read this for us? All right, thank you, Jasmine. May God be gracious. Uh, wait, Psalm to, 60, yeah, to us. 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make us his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the, and, uh, and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Wonderful. All right, so this is a praise to God, um, saying let all the nations praise you. And we see this really being carried out in and through the, the Great Commission uh, when churches all around the world 
are gathering every week to praise God. Right? So first, learn about God's heart for the nations. And then we are to um, care about the things God cares about. Right? So we should grow in our heart and our love for, for the nations. Uh, yes, for the people, but our primary motivation should be for the glory of God and for his worship to be proclaimed in those places that they're not. John Piper's famous quote, we'll actually be talking about this next week, um, is that missions exist because worship doesn't. So we are going to create more worshipers, um, and that's why missions exist. Uh, worship doesn't exist in many places of the world. And so God isn't being glorified in many places in the world. And so missions exist so that more worshipers can be formed. Any thoughts on this first one? All right. Two. Pray earnestly for the spread of the gospel. Uh, Matthew 9, 38 through 30, or 35 through 38. Um, does anyone want to read this one? Tom? Sure. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When the when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into, the, into his harvest. Wonderful. So he tells us to pray for it. Um, and this is what Jesus does when he's... Um, he's He's training his young men, his disciples, to be the laborers in this harvest, right? To be fishers of men, to be really the foundation of the church here. Uh, quick question for you guys. This is Jesus proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Um, what exactly is Jesus proclaiming? This is before his death, burial, and resurrection. What is he proclaiming here? The kingdom of God is at hand, right? It's, it's about to be here, and then it, it becomes here, right? So if you remember a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, we talked, it might have been even the first week, actually, of this semester, we looked through the Gospel of Matthew and how we see the kingdom of heaven is talked about all throughout, right? Um, the kingdom of God is, is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming, um, Pray that the kingdom of God will come. Jesus tells us to pray for it. And we see the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven um, is being proclaimed. And then the kingdom of God comes. Where do we see it come? When the church is established. Um, so yeah, he's, he's teaching that the kingdom of God is being established here on earth. And that's seen visibly, expressed visibly through the church itself. So, um, are our prayers outward focused for the kingdom of God to expand? So this is just a question for us personally then. Um, when we pray to God, hopefully we're, we, we pray, right? I mean, that's the w main way we express our affections for God. We worship God is through prayer. Uh, when we do pray, do we pray for the kingdom of God to be expanded? Uh, outward focused, like Jesus uh, tells us that we ought to pray earnestly for this. So, next one. Any questions on the second one? Next one. Plan to partner with other churches. Um, there's many local churches all around the world, and we can get a lot of things done when we partner together in that. And we do that well with the um, cooperative program with the SBC, the Southern Baptist Churches, and how we can work together to carry out the Great Commission with the IMB, the International Mission Board. Um, here, Philippians 1, 3-5 says, I thank God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel for the first day until now. Uh, we see many others partnering with, with Paul um, in carrying out the Great Commission. 
therefore send out people who will preach the gospel. We said earlier, right, that it's the church that sends out people to share the gospel. Um, so what should churches do in missions? Send people out. The church sends. Uh, who are they to send? People who can share the gospel. Right? We need to be able to share the gospel, whether that's through like a formal preaching or that's just personal evangelism. Right? We need to be able to send people who can preach the gospel. Does anyone want to read Romans 10, 13 through 15? All right, thank you. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good things. Wonderful. So we see, right, there's, we need people to be sent in order for them to preach so that people can hear, so that people can believe um, in order to worship the Lord. Five, pay to support those who go out to share the gospel or care for those really you send. Um, I have two passages here where we're just seeing examples of uh, Paul being supported financially or just receiving gifts, being cared for as he goes out to do missionary work. Uh, I'll read third John or yeah, the third John five through eight. It says, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of the Lord or of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, um, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that they may be fellow workers of the truth. And then Philippians is also a classic example here. Does anyone want to read Philippians for us? What was that? Can I read twice? Read, yeah, well, of course. Even in Thessalonica, you, church and Philippi, send me, send me help for my need once and again. Not that I seek to give, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. I have fragrant offering, sacrifice, acceptable, and pleasing to God. Yep. <laughs> Send pastors and elders to help establish churches in needy areas. Yep, yep. So that's the sixth one, right? Send pastors and elders to help establish churches in needy areas. So this number six is very similar, if not the same, as number four. Um, but it's just a little bit more specific in what you're sending. Because we see this uh, in Titus 1.5, uh, where it says, This is why I left you in Crete. Titus was left in Crete, so that you might uh, put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So we see as the gospel went through Crete and all around the world, uh, churches are being put in order, right, in a formal gathering where there's elders appointed um, in different areas. So since the Great Commission is accomplished through planting churches, Training pastors really is central to this mission. Um, so it's important for others to be able to train and teach pastors in order to be able to pastor well. That's kind of like a quick run through of just six. Like I said, this list isn't necessarily exhaustive. You could probably come up with a lot more. Um, are there any comments or, or questions on any of these things? or helpful verses that you thought of that I necessarily didn't really put in, or anything? Or maybe you could think of something else that should be on this list that I did not put on this list. They do, yeah. 
some of both, I guess. Um, so, I mean, ideally, I think um, those who should be sent out are those who are already faithfully serving in a local church somewhere. And I think one of the best ways to get training for missionary work is by serving in a local church. Because what do you want to do when you're serving as a missionary is to help establish or help strengthen local churches in those areas. So one of the best ways to get training for that is through um, your local church in a different part of the world. But obviously language learning and cultural acquisition, like those sort of things are important as well. Um, but primarily is just serving in, through a local church and in through a local church, I think is one of the best trainings to do that somewhere else in the world, that same thing. Maybe we'll talk about this, but about short-term versus long-term missions and how that can sometimes be debatable as whether short-term going to come with a week is helpful or not helpful or just, yeah. you know, I don't know if there's kind of do you have a Do you have an opinion on that? I don't know if I necessarily have an opinion. I've yeah. never been on a missions trip. I've been a part of a church we were in Okinawa that sent, prior to COVID, sent short-term missions. They, they went to India, they went to mm. Philippines, and they did, you know, work there with either a church or an orphanage that our church supported. Um, and I think the people there welcomed that partnership because it was a regular uh, thing that happened um, until COVID. And then it, they were starting back up, of course, after COVID allowed, pass on and travel was allowed. You know, but I know there's some people that are really just like, you know, like there's that book, One Helping Hurts, I think, that yeah. came out several years ago. I didn't read it, but I understand the gist of it. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Many people can be very cynical when it comes to short-term missions. I'm not one of those people. Um, and I don't think our churches at all. We, we like short-term missions, and we th see it as valuable. Uh, it has been misused, I think, also, though. I mean, just whereas many times it could be used just as like a fun vacation and that's not the point of it, right? And um, if that's coming from church funds, that's not necessarily a good way to spend church money. Um, but I think it could be done really well. And when it's done well, I think it could be incredibly valuable. So, um, but we're not specifically going to talk, get into that tonight. Um, though that would be a good discussion to have, I think. Um, I think one of the best ways to do short-term missions um, is to go somewhere regularly as a church so you could build relationship, right, with the people you're serving internationally and ideally um, do that for individuals that you sent out yourself to support them through short-term missions even. Um, so, I mean, we would love that if you guys came eventually to South Asia. <laughs> and uh, because you're already supporting us by going, uh, but then also that would be one of the ways you would also support us potentially is if you were to send a short-term team. Um, Lord willing, we don't know what that will look like in years to come. But I think that is a way to do it well. Any thoughts on that short-term mission stuff? Oh, anything about any of the six things on the list? So I got something. Um, so on my return from my first deployment to Iraq, we, the chaplain for the Medal of Honor Society met us there. Yeah. And he said the way to look at any person is three kind of bins of any healthy person, which is personal, professional, spiritual. It was a really good speech. It was, it was amazing. But um, as I read through this, I see like, professional, so funding, money, so, and then spiritual, praying. I think one thing that local churches need to be ready to do is you're sending people into austere places as alien to them. You need to be ready as a church to provide them the emotional support they need to deal mm -hmm. with the thing, pick up the phone, send the email, respond to the email, provide them that link back to home that will give them the strength they need to be able to continue on in God's work. That's great. I agree. That would be very encouraging just to have those types of outreaches mm -hmm. to those serving overseas. Yeah. 
All right, well now, uh, this next section is going to involve a little bit more thinking. So hopefully you guys aren't too tired. So I'm feeling a little tired, but um, this will involve a little bit more thinking I th uh, as we do this theological reflection, um, looking through these questions. So thinking back to what we said earlier, uh, theological reflection begins with God, remains with God, and ends with God. We say that uh, because really all things flow out from the doctrine of God, including our ecclesiology and our missiology, which really ought to lead to doxology uh, because we do theology as Christians, really, to worship God. Uh, so let's look at these questions. How does missions begin, remain, and end with God? This could be very easy, maybe, or it could be a harder question. I don't know. So what I have is it begins with God through um, the being directed by Jesus in the Great Commission. It remains with God by through the Holy Spirit spreading the word, because you're not doing it, you're, spread it, you're doing it through the Holy Spirit. And it ends with God through the glorification of the Father by making more believers. That's a great answer. Anyone else? I'm happy with no. <laughs> Poor William. Um... But yeah, that's, that's a great answer. Does anyone else have anything, though, for that? And how you might answer it? Yeah? Um, the quote Matthew says that it is his harvest. And I, I mean, I think he covered it. It's recognizing that it's, you know, being empowered and inspired by God and any work that's going to happen is going to come through the Spirit. That's right. Yeah. I mean, God initiates it. God has to sustain it, and it ultimately it leads to him, right? Uh, I mean, we could also go to the m most famous Bible verse in the world, John 3.16, for God so loved his world, uh, world that he gave his only begotten son, right? So there, the mission is starting. It's the mission of the Father sending his son to redeem the world. Um, so before it's even our mission, before it's even commissioned to us, I mean, it's the mission of God to save the world, right? So we see a beginning there. Um, yeah, and it's, it's done through the body of Christ now, and uh, it leads ultimately to the world knowing Christ, the end for us to be able to worship him. All right, next question then. How does rooting our missiology in the doctrine of God lead to doxology. We kind of said it, but how do yeah. we like make it in a nice statement, put in a nice statement? How does reading our missiology and the doctrine of God, because that's what we're doing when we are saying it re begins, remains, and end with God. So we're, we've already s started reading it in the doctrine of God, um, where God's really doing it all the way through. So how does that help lead to doxology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so leading people to God. And so it's not just leading people to be like in close proximity to God, but it's leading people to love God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's leading people to know him and then to love him which is to then worship him, right? To have uh, spiritual affections for God. Do we have affections for God? Um, we, we want to help lead others to have affections for God, and that's how it leads to doxology, right? Are you all tracking along with this? Wonderful. Um, let's look at this last question. How does... Recognizing the local church as the means and end of missions. So I, I mentioned that earlier. Properly place missiology in the doctrine of God. I kind of said this already earlier without me thinking about it. How does recognizing the local church as the means and end of missions properly place missiology in the doctrine of God. Before we talk more about that, I want us to read these couple passages here. Ephesians again, and then 
Revelation 19. Um, does anyone want to read the Ephesians section for us? Lonnie. Even as he chose us in, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleaned her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself with sp in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Okay. So here we see in the beginning of Ephesians, chapter 1, right, that it's God chose us, to be holy and blameless. We see the end result and the purpose of his will, right? Uh, for, is for us to be holy and blameless. And then jumping ahead a couple chapters here then, uh, it's talking about how husbands ought to love their wives, but it's a, it's a mystery hidden in that where that really represents how Christ is, loves his church, loves, loves the church, right? And this love um, is a certain type of love that sanctifies her. So how do we become holy and blameless that we see identified, mentioned first in chapter 1? He chose us for that, but how do we become that? Because we know we're not that because of sin. How do we become that from this passage? Say that one more time, Nancy. Yeah, so he makes us holy when he, when he forgives us our sins, right? As he loves us, right? So this is a transforming type of love, a sanctifying type of love. Um, he cleanses her, the church, uh, by the washing of water and of with the word so that he might present the church to himself with splendor without spot or wrinkle. So now we see the church is ready for her groom, Christ, the second return of Christ. So now here in Revelation 19, we see now this marriage happening between Christ and his church for all believers of all time. Does anyone want to read Revelation chapter 19 for us? I'll read it. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Wonderful. So... Missions begins with God because before the foundations of the world, he chose us to be holy and blameless. So there's some work to do because we're not holy and blameless. So mission is going out to complete that task. Uh, and this is done um, as God loves the world. He sends his son. Uh, he joins us to himself. We abide with Christ. We are in Christ. He helps us carry out this mission until it's completed, until we are holy and without blemish. And then we see here at the end of time in Revelation chapter 19, the church is holy. She is made clean. She is pure. Uh, where she's able to wear fine linen. She, um, her, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. They're holy. They're ready for their marriage with, with Christ, and which is the end result, right? How it ends with God for us to be in communion with God forever, for all of eternity, in perfect union and harmony and worshiping him. So how does recognizing, so going back to this question again, how does recognizing the local church as the means and ends of missions properly place missiology in the doctrine of God? Um, I wrote, it properly places missiology in the doctrine of God because the church is the body of Christ helping the bride of Christ get ready for the return of Christ. So it's 
The church is the body of Christ, helping the bride of Christ get ready for the return of Christ. How do we get ready for the return of Christ? By growing in holiness. Yeah, by having righteous deeds. That happens when we grow in in holiness, right? So we might be blameless. So it definitely does not just start at just convert or end with just conversion, right? But then we have to teach all that I have commanded you to look like Christ. So that's why missions ought to care about discipleship, care about personal holiness in people's lives. And that starts with our own life. Um, Are we growing in holiness ourselves Uh, before we could really help others grow in holiness as well? So, let me say it again. It properly places missiology in the doctrine of God because the church is the body of Christ, helping the bride of Christ. So the body of Christ is the means helping the bride of Christ um, get ready for the return of Christ. Uh, that we might be a holy and blameless body, bride for Christ. So that then we are worthy to behold the glory of God by sight and not just by faith anymore. So right now we, we are able to behold the glory of God by sight now so that one day we can behold his glory by Sight. Did I say that wrong? We behold the glory of God by faith now so that we could behold the glory of God by sight one day as we are then made holy. All right. Any comments or questions about any of this that we talked about? I attached an article on the back um, just to supplement some of this stuff that we talked about. I think it's a helpful um, goal of missions here. So feel free to read that. And then we will join back next week, continuing the topic on missions. Next week, we'll be talking more so um, about um, John Piper and his, uh, so a pastor and his um, It came out of a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. Some people are reading it from the missions class um, where he has a famous quote that he mentioned earlier. Missions exist because worship doesn't. We'll be talking about some of those themes next week. Um, Any other thoughts or comments about anything? Okay, let's pray. Lord, we love you and... Lord, we thank you that you have given us your spirit, that you help us, Lord, you guide us, you direct us uh, to carry out your great commission, Lord. We thank you that you have not left us, but you will be with us to the end of the age as you promise us in the great commission, Lord, that we may continue the mission that you have started, Lord. We thank you that we have the opportunity to participate in it, Lord, I pray that we will be um, sensitive to the leading, to your leading, Lord, in our lives, that we will obey you um, and that we will um, not shy away from sharing the gospel with others all around us, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen.